I want you to hit me as hard as you can. He's a proud Canadian who's skilled at making funny voices. And with those funny voices, Mike Myers changed the world. With just a rocker dude, a secret agent, and a stinky ogre, Mike Myers made a name for himself as one of the kings of comedy. He was the Peter Sellers of the 90s, being all sorts of wacky characters. And even though all those characters seem to have the same sense of humor, it is a great sense of humor. A sense of humor that we needed at that time. And maybe still need. But it feels like we haven't heard from this funny man in a while. He had hit after hit, iconic character after iconic character, catchphrase after catchphrase, and then suddenly, nothing. It was as if he'd lost his mojo. Or was there something more? Let's find out what the f*** happened to Mike Myers. The actor, not the killer from Halloween. What the fuck is this man? Austin Powers. Doc said Michael Myers. This is Mike Myers. It should be the Halloween man. This is a Halloween mask. No, the killer dude from Halloween. Oh, you mean Jason. No. Mike Myers was born and raised in the suburbs, growing up in a world much like that of Wayne's. As a young little baby Michael Myers, his mother would read to him fairy tales with funny little voices for all the different characters. These silly sounds had an enormous impact on young Mike's sense of humor. In fact, the first book that they ever read was Cat in the Hat. He was a child actor in commercials and low-budget kids' TV shows, and in high school he appeared on many television productions, preparing him to create Wayne's World. It's something I've been doing since I was 12 years old. It was the suburban adolescent North American heavy metal experience as I knew it growing up in the suburbs of Toronto in the mid-70s. He followed in the footsteps of many SNL cast members and joined the cast of Second City. In 1989, he joined the cast of Saturday Night Live as a featured performer. And on the show, Myers went on to create memorable characters that made him stand out amongst other skits at the time. There was Linda Richmond from Coffee Talk, based on his mother-in-law at the time, Dieter from Sprockets, and of course, Wayne from Wayne's World, who showed the world how to party on. And ironically, Mike was the least partying cast member of SNL at the time. He was more of a quiet family man compared to the wild bunch of SNLers of the early 90s. So the real Wayne didn't party on. <laughs> His Wayne's World sketches were so popular that it got a feature film in 1992. It was called Wayne's World. It was a huge success, making over $200 million in 1990s money. This is probably the best SNL movie ever made, in my opinion, and I'm always right. If you disagree, comment your comment in the comments. This is a wonderful, wonderful film, even though Mike and the director would often clash and disagree on many of the jokes. Example, the director wanted to use a Guns N' Roses song in the famous headbanging car scene, but Mike insisted on Bohemian Rhapsody. And as we all know, Mike was right. And this scene actually got Queen back to number one on the charts again. And Mike even threatened to walk away from the film if they didn't use Bohemian Rhapsody. Wayne's World was Mike's baby, and he only wanted to make the film that he imagined. And Mike put his foot down and people saw a different side of Mike. And yeah, as we all know, the Bohemian Rhapsody song, it's, it's perfect for this scene. Mike doesn't like to be directed. And even though Mike was correct to use the Queen song, Bohemian Rhapsody, this was the beginning of the Hollywood whispers that Mike was difficult to work with. He didn't understand the traditional Hollywood system ways of getting things done. And since he was the creator, the writer, the producer, the star, it was hard to place him. And nobody really knew what his responsibilities were. And this would often result in him stepping on people's toes. And Mike has always been an outsider in Tinseltown, which is actually why I like him so much. Wayne's World was followed by the sequel, Wayne's World 2, in 1993, with a different director this time. But the behind-the-scenes drama continued. There was legal and copyright issues that forced Mike Myers to completely rewrite the script, and he put the studio in a very legally dangerous situation. And Mike was yelled at by the producer so hard that rumor has it Mike curled up in the fetal position. Very sad. Wayne's World 2 is a very good sequel. It is what it is. It's fun. It has many hilarious gags, but it didn't make enough money to get a third movie. <laughs> That same year, he starred in So I Married an Axe Murderer, and even though this film was a flop, it developed into a cult hit. He played multiple characters, Charlie and his Scottish father. We got an early rendition of Fat Bastard. Not as fat, but still a bastard. Man! 
SHUT IT! This is a fun romantic comedy and it's, it's full of rom-com cliches, and I can't tell if those cliches are on purpose. I really like this film, but I feel that it only works because of Mike Myers. It feels like his presence adds an extra layer of interestingness to the story. It's one of those movies where you, to make it sound better, you use the word satire. So I'm going to use that word, satire. It's a great satire. But Mike is great and turns this so-so movie into a pretty good movie. But of course, once again, Mike would clash with the filmmakers. Some say the disagreements and arguments on set got pretty dang heated. And the film fell behind its shooting schedule, and this caused Mike to miss many SNL shows. And of course, Lorne Michaels was PO'd. And if you're a comedian, you don't want to piss him off. Mike was making enemies everywhere he went. Mr. Myers stayed on SNL for another four seasons, and then he quit. He decided to take a year and a half off and just do the family man thing. And after a nice long vacation from the spotlight, Mike was ready to unfreeze his newest creation. Oh, behave. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, baby! Yeah! Oh! In 1997, he made the 60s spy spoof Austin Powers, International Man of Mystery. This hilarious film didn't do too well at the box office, but did gangbusters at video sales. It became a huge cult hit. Word of mouth spread quickly on this one. Introducing us to many new catchphrases, and introducing a whole new audience to a different style of comedy. The Austin Powers movies were often screened at sleepovers during my elementary and middle school years. And even though many of the jokes, most of the jokes, went over our adolescent heads, we still loved the film, and would quote along with Mike and the gang as we watched the VHS tape on loop all night long. We were a generation of kids talking about how shagadelic everything was without knowing what shagadelic was. I'm still not exactly sure. And of course, Mike shines as the hero, Austin Powers, and as everybody's favorite villain, Dr. Evil. And Mike's Wayne's World co-star slash best friend forever, I hope, Dana Carvey, claims that Dr. Evil was based on Dana's impression of Lauren Michaels. And Dana felt a little slighted and claims that Mike stole the impression? I don't know. What do you think? Comment your comment in the comments. In 1998, Mike showed off his dramatic side in 54, a film about Studio 54. The film did well, and Mike's performance was praised across the land. People were like, hey, he's actually an actor, and he can act. I guess I just wanted to welcome you all back to say, this time, I hope it does last forever. And he did another dramatic performance that same year in the film Pete's Meteor. The next year was 1999, one of the best years for movies ever. And one of those movies was Austin Powers' The Spy Who Shagged Me. This sequel was a huge hit, making more money in the opening weekend than the first film did in its entire run in theaters. This time he played three characters, Austin Powers, Dr. Evil, and Fat Bastard. And apparently Mike loved making the Austin Powers films and says that the experience was like going to camp, playing around every day. So at least he was having fun this time. Ooh! Frisky, are we? And he had a small part in the film Mystery Alaska, a film directed by the Austin Powers director Jay Roach. It's a hockey movie. In 2001, he took on the role of Shrek, which was left over by the late legend Chris Farley. I, for one, would have loved to see and hear a Chris Farley Shrek, but it was probably smart for the studio to go with an actor who was still alive. And Mike did a great job. Another iconic character. But it could have been much different. Mike wasn't pleased with the original Canadian Shrek voice that he did. So he was difficult again and begged the studio to let him re-record all of his lines, this time in a working class Scottish accent. Mike truly believed that this voice fit the character much, much better. And was he right again? Yes, he was right again. This Scottish accent was much like the voices that his mother would do when she would read him fairy tales. Aww. But the re-recording decision cost the studio millions of dollars in reshoots but it did pay off. 
and we got to hear that lovable Scottish accent for a few more Shrek films, and some Christmas specials, karaoke dance party, and even a 3D theme park ride. Shrek was everywhere, and he, he still is. There's even creepy fan fiction that once I accidentally saw, and it's, oh my god. <laughs> but Shrek was pretty much DreamWorks' Mickey Mouse at that time, and the first Shrek is actually pretty hilarious. It was kind of groundbreaking for animation at the time. There's even some subtle adult humor for you adults out there, so everyone can enjoy. Like, I thought they were just making jokes that this guy was short, but no, like, I, th I think I think they're talking about his, his, his reproductive organs. That must be Lord Farquaad's castle. Uh-huh, that's the place. Do you think maybe he's compensating for something? <laughs> then came Austin Powers' gold member, which made a lot of gold. And he added yet another character to his resume. That's four this time. Austin Powers, Dr. Evil, Fat Bastard, and gold member. A guy with a golden reproductive organ. This movie's pretty good. It has Michael Caine. And he's perfectly cast as Austin's daddy. Yes, this is a funny movie, but it is the lesser of the Austin Powers franchise. Although nothing beats the opening sequence with all those celebrity cameos. Tom Cruise, Goop, Danny DeVito, and Kevin Spacey as Dr. Evil, which is so perfect now. <laughs> and cut! That's a cut, everybody! Then, Mike Myers was sued by Universal Pictures for millions for backing out of a contract to play his SNL character Dieter in a feature film. Mike Myers said he backed out of the multi-million dollar contract because he was disappointed with the script and refused to let audiences down, even though he wrote the script. Mike countersued, and they eventually settled everything by agreeing to make Cat in the Hat instead. That's right, Mike is only the cat in the hat to get out of a mega million dollar lawsuit. That probably explains why this film is so horrible. But at least he was starring in a film based on his favorite book from childhood. Aww. Once again, Mike was described as difficult on set. The word diva was used a few times, and I believe the word catty could be used in this scenario as well. Then Cat in the Hat hit theaters. And I don't know what you think about this film, but Dr. Seuss probably rolls over in his grave every time a child popped this into their DVD player. This film is so bad that it made Dr. Seuss's widow refuse to let Hollywood do any more live-action adaptations of her late husband's books. Which is probably a good thing. That could have gone better. And like I said before, word soon spread that Mike was trying to control everything on set. And this would rub many people the wrong way. And his diva-like behavior on set has actually been explained by Mike himself. He has admitted to being obsessed with quality control and always wants to deliver the best product possible. So he's an a-hole because he needs to make the movie good. But it was cat in the hat and it wasn't good. So I don't know. But he basically says he's there to work, not to make friends. And any time that he is less than pleasant, it's not about his ego, it's about the film. Then he did a Gwyneth Paltrow flight attendant movie called View from the Top, which is horrible because it's a Gwyneth Paltrow flight attendant movie. Oh, and Donna. Fly away. Then there was that whole Kanye West, George W. Bush, Hurricane Katrina fiasco that he was caught in the middle of, when Kanye said his Kanye stuff the look on Mike's face says it all. It's so awkward. He's terrified. I love it. Let's watch it. The destruction of the spirit of the people of southern Louisiana and Mississippi may end up being the most tragic loss of all. George Bush doesn't care about black people. Please call. And as we know, this was a changing time. Political correctness culture was growing, and Mike kind of became Austin Powers in a way. A man whose humor was lost in time. And if we unfreeze him and show him to new generations, or re-show him to current generations, many will probably view Mike as a relic from the past, and some will be hella triggered by his humor. As you can tell, many of his jokes play off of cultural stereotypes. And somebody somewhere with lots of power made a list of things you can't joke about. And apparently, cultural stereotypes is on that list. Oh, and, and he also does body shaming. 
And sometimes his character treats women like objects. I'm sure there's some stuff that would be viewed as homophobic. Let me check. Um, uh, probably. You know, all the above. All the things. He checks off the whole list, probably. But it's all in good fun. I sat back and I thought about it and I decided that it's okay. It's not racist. Not offensive. I repeat, I have decided that Mike Myers is not a racist. Even though his next film, The Love Guru, was voted number 49 by Complex on a list of the 50 most racist movies of all time according to people who think everything is racist. But what do I know? I know nothing. At least that's what they keep telling me. Many people wrote articles on the internet saying that many claim that this film is offensive to many Hindus. But actually you can see the film as an example of equality because over the career of Mike Myers he has made fun of everyone and everything equally. Which I think is great. The biggest problem with the offensive jokes in The Love Guru is that they weren't funny. Which offends me. What offends you? Comment your comment in the comments! What was that? I didn't hear anything. In the year 2008, The Love Guru hit theaters, and it ruined Mike Myers. Like, overnight. Suddenly, no one respected him anymore, and he, this joke teller, was now a joke himself. This character was supposed to be just a small side character in Austin Powers, but for some reason, Mike thought The Love Guru was funny enough to get his own full-length feature film. The film consists of the same old jokes and gags from Mike, but this time, they all missed the mark. The tone is off-putting and everyone feels like they're trying too hard while also not trying at all. It's, it's hard to explain. And, and the film has many actors who are usually good, sometimes, and even some actors that are great. Mike Myers got Sir Ben Kingsley to do the love guru. And it's nice to see Sir Ben have some fun, but Gandhi. And Justin Timberlake's in it, who is known to be funny sometimes. Actually, this film is just them telling like the same five jokes over and over again, and none of them were even funny the first time. And the film's climax is literally an elephant climaxing on a hockey rink. And this somehow inspires a hockey player to gain self-respect and confidence to win the hockey game and fix his marriage at the same time. That's what happens in the movie. It's horrendous. But like I said before, this film always makes lists of worst films and most racist films, most offensive films, most politically incorrect films. I'd like to thank the Academy. Wow, these things are heavy. Yeah. Put me down, a-hole. Okay. <laughs> he took on a small yet powerful role in Inglorious Bastards. And Mike took the role because, of course, he always wanted to work with Quentin Tarantino. It was good to see him part of that ensemble Tarantino cast. He participated in the SNL 40th anniversary special. There was a much celebrated Wayne's World comeback, and it's, it's really good, actually. And, of course, it made everyone want a sequel, but I think a little Wayne goes a long way. And we should just appreciate that small, refreshing bit that we got in 2015. He, he shouldn't make a Wayne's World 3, it would, he would, it's, it's too much of a risk, it could be horrible, there's a good chance it would be horrible. But doing one of these skits, just a short little thing, there's less of a risk, and you can just focus on being funny. And it was funny. Just give us what we want, give us what the people want. And scene. scene. Alright. <laughs> and that same year, HBO announced that they were teaming up with Mike Myers, but nothing came of it. So that was a no-go faux HBO. Then Mike Myers changed his career up a little bit and became a documentary filmmaker, a documentarian. And he made the film Supermensch by the legendary music producer. The film did very well at the Toronto International Film Festival. It didn't make any money, because it's a documentary. But this was his passion project. He just made it for the art. He's an artist. He also wrote a book, a best-selling book, titled Canada. I haven't read it, but I, I'm guessing it's about Canada. He loves Canada, if you haven't figured that out yet. But writing books, making movies, and telling jokes is not the only thing that Mike Myers does. He spends a lot of his time playing on a hockey team and playing D&D, which is one of the reasons he hasn't had time to make many movies lately. He's also a dad, and that's time-consuming because, uh, kids have to eat and stuff. But the real reason why we don't hear so much from Mike is that he's gained a reputation of turning almost everything down. He's extremely picky on his projects and seems to not really care about money, no matter how many millions they throw at him. He still says no, 
most of the time. And once word got out that he was difficult on set, and that he always says no, the offers slowed down a great deal. Mike seems to have disappeared, lost in the abyss of forgotten Hollywood. Then in 2018, there was The Gong Show. This was a very bizarre take on the classic game show, and Mike actually thought he was being punked when he got offered the role, and we kind of thought we were getting punked too. But it wasn't. We weren't getting punked. It was real. But there were some things that weren't real. Like the host. Mike Myers was not the host. The host was a fictional British comedian who happens to be played by Mike Myers. And I think this is a very interesting idea, but it did confuse many people. Nobody knew what was real and what was fake. Is this a fake guy? Is this a real guy? We don't know. Mike Myers even promoted the show in character and refused to admit his true identity. But after the first season, Mike finally revealed to the world that he was the man behind the toupee and the makeup. I think he felt like this was gonna be his big comeback, but it wasn't. And he had a juicy part in the film Terminal with Margot Robbie, another refreshing dramatic turn, but the film got poor reviews and most people didn't even know Mike Myers was in this one. He has hinted at a new Austin Powers movie, but that was a few years ago and nothing's happened. He said that since he's become a family man, he's tried to do as much work from home as possible, like developing other projects or directing documentaries. The guy conquered Hollywood and he just wants to stay home and enjoy his riches with his family. And his kids are actually big fans of his work. Aww. Better out than in. And Mike recently brought back Dr. Evil into modern times on one of those Jimmy shows, making politically driven jokes that are so popular amongst those late night comedians nowadays. I like this approach to Dr. Evil. A little Dr. Evil comeback goes a long way. And this works better in this new age of YouTube. And it, it works just like the, the tiny Wayne's World comeback. A tiny little bite big enough to satisfy our nostalgic needs, but not big enough to ruin the legacy of these classic films. Dare I say classic? Yeah, I'm gonna say it. Classics, they're classics. Mike even had a clever cameo in Bohemian Rhapsody, playing a guy who doubted the success of the rock opera approach, which is funny because Mike single-handedly is responsible for bringing back Queen into the mainstream. And now Queen is bringing back Mike Myers. Mike has a long-lasting relationship with that long-lasting song. He even broke the fourth wall with it in The Love Guru. And it wasn't very funny, but I'm gonna show it anyway. Here it is. There was supposed to be a Shrek 5 in 2019, but I don't remember that ever happening. Was, was there a Shrek 5? I've honestly lost count. Uh, no, I don't think there was a Shrek 5. But he does have a limited series on Netflix in the works. Once again, he will be playing multiple characters. Not much is known about this mysterious project, but this project could be the one. The one we're all hoping for. It sounds like it's Mike Myers back to his, his good old tricks. I have a good feeling about this one being his comeback. Maybe. Things aren't as bad as they seem. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to dump on you. I'll figure something out, okay? Yes, the humor of Mike Myers is immature and childish at times, all the time, and many of his jokes are recycled. But that's the point. What I love about the comedy of Mike Myers is that when he tells a joke, you look deep into his eyes and you can tell that deep down he's also laughing at how stupid it is. And that adds a whole new layer to the joke. It's like a postmodern poop joke. It's stupid smart, or, or, or smart stupid. And most of the time he feels more like your funny friend at a party, rather than a movie star telling jokes. Which is actually the major appeal of Myers. When you watch a Mike Myers movie, you feel like he's just your buddy, trying to make you chuckle. Mike Myers excels at the spoof, and he actually breaks all of the rules of the spoof. He often parodies things that aren't universally known but the humor is universal, even when he's being sued by Universal. Hairball. 
He swinged himself into pop culture and changed our vocabulary in a very groovy way that allowed us to party on for decades. But maybe one day he will return to form and have a huge comeback and bring us a new iconic character, or characters, plural. And monkeys might fly out of my butt. JK. He's a brilliant comedian slash artist who made millions of dollars at the box office and made millions of people laugh out loud. Comedy is a little funnier because Mike Myers told some jokes. I just love this lovable Canadian dork. And you know what? I've thought about it. And, and he, Mike has done his time. He made his movies and they are great. Most of them. So he doesn't really need a comeback. And you know what? We're not worthy of one. And that is what the f*** happened to Mike Myers. Yeah, baby.